Okay, as I mentioned, we are studying this new book here in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. And if you look at verse number 19, I couldn't help but just uh, use this phrase as the title for the sermon this morning. It begins in verse number 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. And so the title for the sermon this morning is a more sure word of prophecy. A more sure word. This is speaking about uh, the Bible. This is speaking about the book you guys hold in your hands. This is a sure word of prophecy, okay? And by sure, you know, you can be confident. You can be established. You can be grounded. You know this is the truth. You know, we are constantly bombarded with things that are half-truths or maybe even outright lies, but we have the Word of God. We are so blessed, brethren. We are so blessed to live in a wicked world and have the truth of God available in our hands. But let's start off there in verse number 1. It says, Simon Peter, so of course, Second Peter, written by Peter the Apostle, and he, of course, mentions the fact he's an apostle here. He says, Simon Peter, Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so what I like about Peter, yes, he highlights the fact that he holds uh, the, the, the office of an apostle, which, of course, is the highest office one can hold in the New Testament, unless you're Jesus Christ, of course, he's the Lord God. But the average human being, the highest office somebody could have in the New Testament was the office of an apostle, okay? And so that is a high office that he holds. But I love how he says, what he says before he mentions being an apostle. He says, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so, you know, he's got the humility about himself. Yeah, he's an apostle. Of course, he holds that office. But he says, but first of all, I'm a servant, Okay, and that's a, you know, a good reminder for anybody holding any office in the New Testament, whether you're a pastor, whether you're a deacon, you, know, you, you must remind yourself and not think of yourself high-minded, not think of yourself above others. The fact is you are called to a, a position of service. You know, being a pastor, it, it's my job to serve you. you know, and as I covered before, the main job that I have to serve you is to feed you the Word of God to feed you spiritual nourishment coming from the Word of God. And so, of course, that requires study. All that study, preaching God's Word, is all a service that I'm providing to the people of God. And, you know, I'm a servant, of course, right? And so I like that about him. But then he says to them, so that's referring to himself, who is he writing to? To them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so he mentions the fact that we all, he himself as an apostle, the believers is writing to, this includes ourselves, we have a like precious faith. He's saying, look, we're like-minded in faith, okay? And he calls that our, our faith, of course, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, our faith in the gospel, he calls that a precious faith. And of course, when you think of something that is precious, we think of something that is rare, right? We think of something that is valuable. You know, it's got a high value. It's rare. Not everybody has this faith. And brethren, I know we, we tend to think about, you know, yes, we got saved by faith and that's wonderful, but it's a precious faith. It's a rare faith. Not many people believe on Jesus Christ. Not many people believe the gospel. They believe in, there are many gospels, many people believe in, in some false gospel, another gospel, but not many people hold to this precious faith, this valuable faith. Praise God that you have this faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse number two. It says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. All right. Now, I think all of us want to live our lives full of grace and peace, as it says there in verse number two, right? Grace is undeserved merit, undeserved favor. We want the Lord to look favorably upon us, to be gracious toward us. We want to live a, peace, a life of peace, don't we? We don't want to be constantly arguing, constantly fighting, constantly at war. We want to live a life of peace, okay? And the promise is grace and peace can be multiplied to you there, okay? But there is a condition. How do we have grace and peace multiplied to us? It says, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So if you want this multiplied to you, it's saying you have to have the knowledge of God. You have to know God. You have to know Jesus, brethren. You can't think that, you know, I'm, I'm saved. I know Jesus. Well, you know the gospel. You, you know the message of salvation. Praise God. But unless you put your head into the word of God, you cannot truly know Jesus. You know, Jesus Christ is the word of God. The Bible you hold in your hands is the word of God. The only thing that will draw you closer and give you a greater knowledge of God is the Word of God, brethren. And so you've got to have your heads in this book. 
If you find that your life is, is not, you don't, you don't have the grace and peace in your life, well, think about how's my Bible reading? How's my Bible study? Am I investing time in God's Word or am I investing time in other things? You want that multiplied to you? You have to know God. You can only know God through the more sure word of prophecy. Okay? Verse number three. Not only that, not only does grace and peace come by knowing God, verse number three, it says, according to His divine power, uh, have given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Look at this. So we want to live lives. He wants us to live life. He's given us everything we need, brethren, to live lives unto, to live, uh, unto life, right? To have a full life, to have a happy life and godliness. What's godliness? Being Christ-like. Right? Being, you know, uh, you know, reflecting God in our lives, right? Being godly is to reflect the Lord God in our lives, right? So he's saying, look, everything's been given us to live an abundant life, to live a righteous and holy life. But how is that given to us? Again, through the knowledge of Him that have called us to glory and virtue. All right? So God has called us. He wants us to live lives of glory and virtue. He says, okay, that's the goal. That's what I need to live for. I understand, God. How do I live that? Well, through the knowledge of Him. The more you get to know God, the more your life will reflect glory and virtue. The more your life, you know, you can live a full, abundant life and, and have the godliness in your life, that you would reflect Jesus Christ in your life. Okay? Again, it's coming from the Word of God. You neglect God's Word. You will not live a life of glory and virtue. You will not have grace and peace multiplied unto you. You will not live a life of, uh, pertain to the life that God wants you to live and a godly life. Look at verse number four. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. God wants us to be partakers of his divine nature. That's godliness. When it's talking about living a life of godliness, that's us partaking of the divine nature, living like God wants us to live, reflecting God on this earth. We're not gods ourselves, of course, but we can live and reflect God. We can teach people about God. We can live that life of the divine nature. It says, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And so then we see the battle that we all suffer with, right? The fact that we're called to live this life, this abundant life of the divine nature, but we're also escaping, or we have escaped. And that's something we need to remember. When you are saved, you have, right? Having escaped, this is a past tense thing. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Does that mean we'll never lust? Does that mean we'll never corrupt ourselves? Does that mean we'll never sin? No, of course. What is this teaching us? That we have a divine nature. That divine nature, you know, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, it says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Hey, you cannot commit sin. You said, but I committed sin this, even this morning, Pastor Kevin. Well, yeah. But it says here, whosoever is born of God. The, the nature, the divine nature that's been born of God, that cannot sin. Okay, it says, for his seed, that's God's seed, remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And so what this is highlighting to us, brethren, the fact that we have this divine nature that we are to live according to, tells us the fact that we have a dual nature. We have that divine nature, which is that which is born of God, the new man, the spirit that is within us, okay, okay, that's been born again. And we have the corruption, the flesh, that which has been born of man, right? And that is the battle that we have. But God just reminds us here, we have escaped. You know, our position before God is a position without sin. The part of us that goes to heaven is not the corrupted flesh, but the divine nature, the new man that is within us. That is what goes to heaven, all right? And so... We're just being reminded here, God has given us that power already. We already have the ability to have victory over sin as we sung the hymn, you know, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Okay, that's true. The more we know God's word, the more we, we are challenged by, by, by these living words, the greater your ability to overcome the corruptness in your, in your body. Okay, to, to not live in accordance to the flesh, but to live in accordance to that divine nature. Let's drop down to verse number five. And beside this, giving all diligence. Now, diligence, of course, is to put an effort in, right? So what, what Peter's saying here, we need to put an effort in, okay? As, as brothers and sisters, as people that hold this like precious faith, we need to put effort, we need to give diligence to something. Then he says this, 
Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. All right, so what do we have? Let's look at verse number five again. And beside this, given all diligence, add to your faith. All right, we already have the precious faith, okay? And that's wonderful, you're saved. Praise God. You know, you've got something that is very rare to this world. But we don't stop there, brethren. Once we have the faith, there is something we need to add to the faith, something we have to give diligence, put the effort to add to our faith. And you see many of those things that are named there, right? Let's go through them. It says, add to your faith virtue, that's one. And then it says, and to virtue knowledge, that's two. And to knowledge temperance, three. And to temperance patience, that's four. And to patience godliness, that's five. And to godliness brotherly kindness, that's five. Uh, six, sorry. And brotherly kindness charity, that's seven. He's saying, look, you've got the faith. Now add these seven things to your life. Put the effort in. Add these things to your life. So let's think about what these are. It says, and to faith virtue. Virtue is moral excellence. Okay? You ought to be different. You ought to be different from this corrupt world. You ought to live a life that's very different. You look at certain practices, certain activities done by this world, and you say, well, that's what the world does, but I've got a higher moral compass. You know, I'm trying to live after excellence. I'm trying to be godly. Oh, godly is covered there later, right? But I'm trying to live differently from the Word. It should separate us, right? Virtue, moral excellence, and then knowledge. Knowledge. Hey, we saw how important it was to us to know God, to know Jesus Christ. And so knowledge is important. We can't remain simple-minded. Okay, we need to grow. And there's no greater knowledge than the Word of God, which is 100% truth, right? Knowledge. What is knowledge? The, the acquiring of facts, right? Of truth and principles. This is like learning doctrines, learning your Bible, learning what God has to say about certain topics. That's gaining knowledge. And then it says temperance. What's temperance? Well, think of the word temper there, kind of thing, right? Temper. This is about being uh, self controlled, okay? Doing things in moderation. You shouldn't be known as someone that is highly, I don't know, uh, maybe, you know, loses their, their temper or something like that, or, you know, it, it struggles with addictions, different types of addictions that people struggle with. We need to have self-control. We need to add these things to our Christian life. Moderation. And next one was patience. Patience, you know, we all understand patience, and I think a lot of us would admit that we struggle with patience, and I think the coronavirus situation has given us a lot of patience, has helped us to grow in patience, right? But we need to add this, right? Patience, you know, that's, that's living a life without being annoyed, you know, without complaining, without being irritated, you know, just be patient about things, right? Uh, and then it has godliness, and of course, as I mentioned, the godliness part is living that throughout that, that divine nature that we have within us, and uh, I'll, just, I'll just read a, a portion here, uh, just in, in Ephesians 4.24, you don't need to turn there. It says, And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And so that godliness comes through the new man, okay, the new man. If you find yourself not living a godly life, that's because you're living in the old man. You're living in the flesh. You're living, you're following, you're walking after the works of the flesh, okay? So godliness, that's important. The next one was brotherly kindness. Wow. Hey, that means, hey, this is our chance. This is why you need to come to church. Some people think, well, you know, I don't need to go to church. It's just me and God. Well, how can you have brotherly kindness then? <laughs> We're going to meet believers. We're going to be like-minded people that have that precious faith. That's church. We come together. And your goal when you come to church ought to be, I want to show kindness to my brothers, to my sisters. I want to be kind towards someone. Hey, even that person at church that annoys me, that has irritated me, maybe we've had a clash in the past, your job is to show brotherly kindness. If they have the precious faith, the like precious faith, okay? Your call is to be sympathetic, to be gracious toward your brothers and sisters in the Lord. And the last one was charity. Please keep your finger there and go to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. I, I love this about charity. Charity, of course, is love. 
All right? And I, I think of charity more than just the feelings of love, but, you know, love in action, showing people that you love them. I also think about, you know, we, people talk about donating to charity, charities, and the, the thought there is that the charity is doing something. I don't know if they always do, but they're supposed to be doing something for people that are without, okay, that are lacking certain things. And so it's love in action, right? Love. And so 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, now knowledge is important, we saw that before, we need to add knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. I want you to think about that for a moment, okay? If you just serve in the church, you, you, you're a great preacher, right? You, you know the Bible, you have great knowledge of the Bible. You even give to people. You know, you even give to the poor, you feed the poor. You even allow yourself to be sacrificed, his body, right, burned, to be burned. You know, uh, just, just a self-sacrifice for God but he doesn't do it out of charity. He has no love toward God, no love toward his brothers and sisters, no love toward the lost world. He says, it profits me nothing. Boy, the last thing I want to do, brethren, is live a Christian, as a pastor, serving in a local church and trying to serve God with all that I have and then go to heaven and say, well, it actually profited you nothing. Why? Because you didn't have love. You didn't have charity. You did it for yourself. You, you did it to be noticed of men. You, you did it because you tried to build a reputation. You did it because it made you feel better. You know, and you, I didn't act out of love. Boy, it profits you nothing, okay? And so charity is obviously the most important one that's mentioned in this list. Let's keep, go back to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Now, please don't, forget, don't, don't mistake all these seven things that I mentioned. This is not proof that you are saved or anything like that. Okay, it says, add to your faith all these things. So, of course, we are saved by faith. You know, by, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's our faith that saves us. But now that we are saved, we ought to add these seven uh, uh, you know, attributes to our life, to, to, be, uh, to live that abundant life. Okay? Look at verse number 8. For if these things be in you, what things? The, the seven things that we just read about. If these things be in you and abound... So, yeah, you know, maybe you can work toward it. Maybe, maybe you go for that list, you can say, look, there are certain things that I don't have. Okay, add it. Okay, but it's not, don't just add it. Don't just uh, get a little bit of charity. I've got a little bit of brotherly kindness. The next thing is, once you add it, you've got to abound in that. You, you've got to be the expert in all of these things. You've got to keep striving to these seven things. The, uh, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's think about that for a moment, okay? So if you add these things, it says that you will not be barren or unfruitful, okay? You're going to be productive for God, right? In the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's think about that for a moment. We're talking about the knowledge of God. We're talking about how we can be multiplied with grace and peace and all these things, you know, if we have the knowledge of God. And I talked about, yeah, of course, that's coming from reading the Bible, but some people think that the knowledge of God and reading your Bible is all about doctrine. If I just know 100% doctrine, if this cryptic verse, if I just have the right understanding, that, makes, that proves that I know God. Well, yeah, that's important. We saw in those seven things, one of those things was knowledge. But you know what? The other six things is not about your knowledge. The other six things is your character. It's your behavior. It's how you live your life. Brethren, so if you're someone, look, you might have greater knowledge than me. You may, maybe you've read the Bible more than me. I don't know. Maybe you know every verse, you know, you've got, you've just got a great knowledge, but you're lacking in charity, brotherly kindness. You're lacking, lacking in patience. You're, you're lacking in all the other things that I mentioned there. Uh, temperance, virtue. You're lacking in all these things, brethren. Then you don't really know God. You don't really know God. You, you've gained a head knowledge of information, but you don't know God until you're living them out, until you put that stuff into practice, until your character reflects a godly character. Then you can say about that individual, that man or that woman knows God. 
It's not just how much they know the Bible, brethren. It's living out what they know. I would rather just know 50% of my Bible and live in accordance with 50% that I know and show that I'm living in accordance with 50% that I know than know 100% of the Bible and not live out any of it. Because knowledge is just one part of it. The other six parts, what's your character? How you live your life, okay? And so, you know, the, there can be a misunderstanding, you know, if, if oh, well, I, I know the doctrine's right and you think you're close to God, you think you know God, you don't. If you're not living in accordance to these attributes that have been there. So these seven things are not just some option, brethren. Well, I kind of, I guess it is your, it's your choice if you want to put these things in your life. But the expectation is there. God wants you to add these things. This is how you know God. Okay, if you don't add these things, then you're going to remain barren or unfruitful. Okay, in verse number eight. Verse number nine. Verse number nine. But he that lacketh these things, ooh, what is he going to say? So if you're lacking in these areas, brethren, seven things. This is where the hard preaching comes in. It says, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Brethren, this is a reality check for all of us. To look at this list and say, do I, do I live in accordance to this list? And if I don't, what does it say? If you lack of these things. If you lack in any of these areas, the Bible tell, God is telling you, you're blind. You're lacking vision. You can't see what the Christian life is meant to be. You cannot know God properly. You need to have these things in your life. Okay? And have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Now, this is not saying that you've forgotten that you were saved or something. That's not what it's saying, okay? The forgetting of that you're purged of your old sins is, is forgetting that you, you've, you've received the power of deliverance, okay? You've been delivered from your old sins. You, that power, the, the God's power that has delivered you, that has saved you from your sins, you've forgotten about that power. You've forgotten how God has delivered you in the sense, not that you're saved, but that you, well, okay, I'm saved, but... How do I, you know, you're not applying that knowledge of that power, of that, that deliverance in your daily life, in your daily walk. You're not applying that in your life. That's why you've forgotten it. Because you've forgotten the power of God that He can have in your life, right? That He was able to purge you from your sins. And so, you know, God has given us, as I said, the ability to live lives that are not like your former self. You know, he's giving you that ability. Now, you're going to struggle with the same temptations. Like I said, you still have that nature, that, that fleshly nature in you, that carnal nature in you, that wants to do the same sins that you did before you were saved, okay? That struggles with those same temptations. But when you struggle with that, when the temptation comes, remind yourself, hey, I've been purged from my old sins. I've been forgiven. I've been saved. God has given me the power of salvation. And that same power allows me to live a life that is clean, you know, that lives a life that is, you know, uh, follows after these seven things that we ought to add to our faith, to live a life that is godly, that is righteous, that is holy. We all have that ability to live better, holy lives, okay? It's the expectation from God. He expects you. He's given you the ability. He's given you the new man. He's given you that divine nature to live after Him. So let's not forget that we have that power within us. Verse number 10. Wherefore the rather, brethren... Give diligence, there it is again, put the effort in, to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Okay, again, what is he talking about? The seven things that I mentioned, right? Now let's, it says, let's, let's talk about the end of that verse. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. You know, so if you live in accordance to these seven attributes, you won't ruin your life. You're not going to ruin your reputation. You're not going to ruin your testimony. You know, you're not going to be found out in some scandal if you live in accordance to these seven things. This is why it's so important that we add it to our lives. Now, if you neglect these things, guess what's going to happen? You're going to fall. You are going to destroy uh, your testimony, you know, your life, okay? And so, let's talk about the first part there, though, in verse number 10. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. This is not saying, of course, when you talk about like, calling and election, talk about the fact that, you know, uh, the fact that you're saved, that you're saved, right? This is not saying that uh, you have to live righteous lives. It's not saying that you have to live in accordance to these seven things to be saved or that this proves that you're saved. It's not saying anything like that, okay? It's not saying uh, make sure you live righteous lives to be saved. That's not what it's saying. When it says here uh, to make uh, your calling and election sure, the sure there is to strengthen, okay, to keep something stable, 
You know, if you said, are you sure? You say, are you confident? Are you 100% certain that is true? Okay. And so what we're trying to do, brethren, we need to make our calling, our election, that's the life that God wants us to live. Okay. He's called us to live righteous life. We need to make that sure. We need to strengthen that life about us, right? We need to uh, 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 establish ourselves, you know, in the word of God, in, in the way the Lord wants us to live. This is making things Sure. It's the same idea of, uh, if you look back in verse number, uh, where is that? Verse number 19, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, it says, We have also a more sure, there's a word again, a more sure word of prophecy. Okay? So what it's saying there is that the Bible that we have, we can be confident in it, right? This is sure. This is uh, established. This is unmovable, okay, because it's a sure word of God. And so what it's saying here, that we need to make sure that we're living those lives of godliness and we're unmovable, we're stable, you know, we're not being tossed to and fro. You know, it's not like, oh, wow, he puts on a great Christian show on Sunday, but then on Monday he's living like the devil, okay? That's not how we're expected to uh, live out, out our Christian lives. Verse number 10, wherefore, uh, sorry, no, I just read that. Verse number 11, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so those that want to teach a works-based salvation will put verse number 10 and verse number 11 together, okay? I mean, there are so many verses people use to try to teach a works-based gospel, okay? Like the idea there, well, you've got to make sure that you're saved by living godly. And then they'll say in verse number 11, see, we, we can enter, uh, for an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly, okay? Uh, so we only enter heaven if we're living according to those lives. Though, you know, the idea is there, right? But look, it's not saying that you enter heaven if you live these lives, okay? Look at it again, verse number 11. For so an entrance, now we will enter into the kingdom of Christ, okay? For so an entrance shall be ministered or served to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so, listen, some people are going to enter into heaven, just with this, the standard, well done, you got saved, right? <laughs> well done, you believed on Jesus, right? The thief on the cross, you know, all he, all he had time for was to put his faith on Jesus. Hey, praise God, it's a precious faith, okay? He did something that was very rare. Most people don't do that, right? Praise God for that. But then some will walk into heaven and it'll be an abundant entrance. You know, be cheering, maybe people that you got saved. Hey, that's the man that came to my door and gave me the gospel. He got me saved, right? And maybe, hey, here's your mansion, right? It's double the size of the person that, you know, didn't do anything for the Lord. And so you walk in abundantly. You're being rewarded. You're being uh, recognized for living a life that is living according to those seven things that we've looked at, okay? And so, yeah, we can have a more abundant entrance into heaven depending on how much you've done for the Lord, you know? And, you know, I was talking to someone, I can't remember who it was. I don't know if it was this church or the Sydney church. Someone had the idea that you only get rewarded if you win souls, all right? Now, of course, that's important. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not diminishing that fact. Of course, winning souls, and that's probably going to be the greatest treasures that you can lay up in heaven because it's not just a treasure. It's a soul that will be with you for all eternity. That's a wonderful thing, of course. But what this is telling us is that if we live in accordance with these attributes, if our Christian life you know, uh, uh, demonstrates uh, a Christ-like life, that we're going to be rewarded abundantly as well because of this you know, as we go into heaven. Okay, so, you know, let's not have that idea. It's just souls that gives us rewards in heaven. I don't know where that comes from. We see many times in the Bible just, you know, different ways that we can have, you know, a, a greater, uh, uh, you know, enjoyment in heaven. Of course, the abundant here is how the Lord will reward us when we go to heaven. Verse number 12. And then he says this, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. And so it would be negligent of a preacher to not talk about this, these things, right? He says, look, uh, Peter's saying, look, I want to make sure I'm not negligent. I need to tell you, you need to live a godly life, okay? You need to add these seven things to your life because it's going to make your entrance to heaven even better. If I didn't tell you this, I would be negligent, he says, all right? So he's saying, look, focus on eternal matters. Lay up your treasures in heaven is what he's basically teaching, right? But then he says this. Though ye know them, he says, I don't want to be negligent, but you already know this. And be established in the present truth. 
So if you look at verse number 12, it says, verse number 12, it says, and put you always in remembrance of these things. You know what this is telling us? We need to be reminded. We need to be brought into remembrance. If you ever come to church and you're like, I've heard this sermon again. I've heard it before, I think. I already know this. Listen, you need to just be brought to remembrance these things. It would be negligent of the pastor or the preacher to not repeat the same things again. You're going to keep hearing me say you've got to be in church. You're going to keep me hearing saying you've got to read your Bible. You're going to keep me, me, you know, hearing me say you've got to pray. You're going to keep hearing me say you've got to win souls. Okay? You're going to keep hearing me say, you know, confess your sins to the Lord. Be, be right with God. Keep a short account. You're going to keep hearing me say these things, brethren. You're going to keep, me, keep hearing me say, lay up your treasures in heaven and not on this earth. You're going to keep hearing that, brethren, because it would be negligent of me if I only mentioned it once and you, we all forgot about it. You know, look, we know these things, but we need to be reminded of these things. You know? And also, we're all at different stages in our Christian life, aren't we? You know, maybe I've preached on something and some members of the church weren't there on that day. And then a couple of years later, I'll preach the same thing or something similar. And you'll be like, I already heard this. Why is he preaching that again? Well, there were people that weren't there and they need to benefit from it. And you need to be reminded anyway. Okay. Never have the attitude, I already know this, and you tune off from the preaching. That's the wrong attitude. Okay. Verse number 13. It says, Yea, I think it meet or necessary. As long, that's necessary to, to remind you guys. As long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. All right. So Peter's saying, look, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, that's his earthly body, I'm just going to keep re- reminding you. I'm going to keep preaching the same thing. Okay. I think it meets. It's necessary to be reminded of these things. Right. And what this reminds me of, if you can just go to 1 Peter chapter 5, just go back a few, few pages there, or maybe a page, maybe the same page. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, just a reminder, it says, The elders which are, which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. So Peter, just a reminder, was a pastor of a church. He's an elder of a church, all right? And a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be re- revealed. And so his role as a pastor, he says, look, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, I'm just going to keep reminding you. I'm just going to keep preaching to you the same things. Over and over again, as long as I'm in this tabernacle. He says, look, until the day I die, you're going to be hearing me preach the Bible. Okay? And brethren, that's my goal. If I see, hey, this is a pastor, this is what he's writing to other elders, and he's saying, look, as long as I'm in this body, I'm going to keep preaching God's word, I'm going to have to keep bringing these things to remembrance, that's my personal goal. I just want to let you know, right? I've been pastoring for almost three years, but it's my personal goal that I'm just going to be a pastor until the day I die. Till I, like, you know, taking on this office, it's not like I thought I'll take on this office, give it a shot for a couple of years, maybe leave the office and do something else, maybe come back into the office. No. Once you've been ordained into the office, it's your role, it's your duty to stay in that office, to keep preaching God's word till the day you die, till, you, you know, till you've got this tabernacle that you're dealing with, brethren. Okay, so I'm going to keep pastoring, all right, till the day I die, or if it's not the day I die, it's definitely when this body gives up, right? If, if this body just mentally cannot do it anymore, you know, we'll definitely have someone else. But look, I see, you know, pastors should just continue, you know, in the role. That, that's, that's what Peter desires, and he's a pastor, right? I think it's a good desire to have. And, uh, and then he says in verse number 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. He says, look, shortly I'm going to die, he says, even as our Lord Jesus Christ have showed me. Now, keep your finger there and go to John chapter 21 for me. John chapter 21. This is how we know, if you were wondering, because I mentioned this before, this is how we know that 1 Peter and 2 Peter are written toward the end of Peter's life. Okay? So there's many, many years after Christ was resurrected. Because he's saying, look, I'm shortly going to die. Jesus told me that I'm going to die soon. Okay? And so it's toward the end of his life. Now, did Peter live a short life or did he live a long life? Well, we find that out in John chapter 21, verse 17. Give you a moment to turn there. John 21, verse 17. It says in John 21, 17, He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. And if you were here for the preaching for First Peter, I explained that this is where I believe he's been ordained by Jesus to be a pastor. 
feed my sheep. That's the role of the pastor. That's the one of the main roles, right? And so not only does he hold the office of an apostle, but he also holds the office of an elder. He, he's pastoring a church. Now, let's keep going. So straight after, he basically says, you've got to be a pastor. Feed my sheep, right? That's a shepherd. He feeds the sheep. Verse number 18. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself. That's you dress yourself when you were young and walkest whether thou wouldest. You walk wherever you want because you're young, you're able, right? You've, and then he says, but when thou shalt be old. So Jesus is telling Paul, uh, Peter, you're going to live a life and you're going to get very old. You're going to get old, right? It says, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands and another shall gird thee. So another person will clothe you, okay? And carry thee whether thou wouldest not. You're not going to be able to get around as easily now when you're old, he's saying, okay? You, you, you'll need help. You'll need somebody, of course, if, you know, this is why people go into nursing homes and things like that, because they cannot take care of themselves anymore. Now, I'm not, actually, I'm not in favor of nursing homes. I believe the right place to be is for the children. Hey, you know, parents, you looked after the children, you raised your children, you gave everything to give to your children. Hey, the children should give something back. You know, this is, this is the, value, the value of having many children, is that instead of that burden of the old, you know, elderly parents falling on one child or a couple of children, it falls on several children, right? So I've got 11 kids, right? Let's say, let's say my wife and I get so old, we can't even dress ourselves. Like, we're just so, you know, we need someone to help us move around. We need someone else to drive around. I can't drive because my eyes are bad or something like that. I need someone else to help me be mobile. Well, they can, it can be one, one child per 11 days, right? And if they've got their own kids, right? <laughs> let's say they have the 10 kids each. Hey, that, that divides it even more. Then grandkids can help out, right? I mean, it's shared, the, the load is shared is what I'm trying to say, okay? And, and so that is the right responsibility that, that children, we, we, I, you know, that's another topic for another day, but they're to look after, they're to honor their parents, even at, you know, when, when they're old and older age. Anyway, what he's saying, what Jesus Christ is telling Peter here, you're going to get so old, you're going to get to a point where you can't even clothe yourself, you can't even get around anymore. And so we know that, Peter lived a life where he's older, right? And so when he's writing 2 Peter, he says, look, I'm about to die just like the Lord showed me. Well, the Lord showed him there in John chapter 21. You're going to live an old life. And some people also take the idea, and I, don't, I can't be certain about this, brethren, but it said there, uh, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands. Some people take that to mean that uh, Peter was, was put to death by crucifixion. Okay? And the, the tr um, historical tradition says that Peter was crucified upside down. Okay, so if you read books like, I think the Fox's Book of Martyrs and similar type of books, they'll say that Peter was crucified upside down. Now, I don't know that. I, I can't, if it's not in the Bible, brethren, how can we really be sure? I mean, just honestly, how can you really be sure? I mean, can we even trust our history books of 100, you know, that talk about things that happened 100 years ago? Can we even trust the history books that the, the current thing's true today? <laughs> right? We can't really be sure about these things. And we have to be careful. Maybe, maybe that happened. I guess it's possible that Peter passed away, that died that, died that way. I guess it's possible. Uh, but we need to be careful, especially as preachers, not to mix the truth of God's Word, which is 100% truth, with the traditions and, you know, of men, which might be true. Might be true. But you've got to be careful when you preach, you make it clear, hey, this is what the Word of God says, and this is what history also says, okay? And it's good. If, if history uh, supports or if science supports what God's Word says, then we know that is true. You know, that, 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 those, that information is true. But the only thing that we know 100% truth is God's Word, right? The more sure word of prophecy that we have in our hands. Now, please go back to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. And so that was just a, a side thing, just so we know, yep, yeah, 2 Peter was written toward the end of Peter's life, okay? He's expecting to pass away. Verse number 15. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease, so after I have died, to have these things always in remembrance. So he says, look, I'm going to keep reminding you. It's negligent of me to not remind you. And I'm going to keep reminding you to the day I die. And that's coming soon. And even after I die, I'm going to make sure you're reminded. You say, how can you remind someone after he dies? This is where the word, more sure word of prophecy comes in. Peter is reminding us right now, brethren, even after he's passed away. We're reading his epistle and he's reminding us once again, hey, live for things of eternity. Add these seven things to your Christian life. Add these things to your faith. He's reminding us all over again. And he's doing it for me this time, right? But this is how he does it, right? The Lord made sure that this became a canonized scripture for us to be still read, be reading some 2,000 years later after 
Peter has passed away, which is amazing. I think it's amazing, right? The Bible says, if you go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 25, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 25, it says, But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So it says, Then the word of the Lord endureth forever. You know what? Peter's going to keep reminding us, reminding us, reminding us till the day we go to, to be with the Lord in heaven. Okay, so Peter was very adamant these things need to be heard over and over again. Again, if you hear things over and over again, don't get discouraged, don't get cast down, don't start to criticize the preacher. It's needed, it's, it's meat, it's, it's negligent for the preacher to not remind you of the same things. All right, back to verse number uh, 16, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, so this is the same thing I just said. You know, I said, you've got to be careful about what is 100% true of God's word and the tradition of men, right? The tradition of men says Peter was crucified upside down. Maybe, maybe not. We don't know, right? And so Peter's just basically saying the same thing. We have not followed after cunningly devised fables. You have to be aware that if it's not coming from God's word, it might be a fable. It might be a cunningly devised fable. It might be there to cause you to lose faith in the Bible, you know, there are so many, if you, if you um, there are so many like uh, documentary channels, uh, you know, if you get the, the Foxtel, Netflix, there's all these documentary channels, right? And so many documentaries deal with Christianity, deal with the Bible. But you watch those things, they're constantly telling you how the Bible is wrong. You know why they're doing that? Because it's a cunningly devised fable, all right? And Peter's to remind us, hey, we have not followed after those things. If you love watching those documentaries, stop watching them. They're causing you to doubt God's word, okay? They're causing you to doubt God's word. He says, look, we've not followed up those things. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Boy, I want to know, I want to know Jesus. We need to know God more. We need to know Jesus more. Well, hey, we've got eyewitnesses that wrote about Jesus. Praise God. Okay, that's how we know about Jesus. God's word, not through some documentary, not through some movie about Jesus' life. You're going to find inconsistencies there as well, right? The Hollywood productions about Jesus, they're not true, okay? But when Peter says here, uh, made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's not his second coming. He's talking about his, the first coming, the fact that he was the eyewitness, of, co of course, of Jesus Christ's first coming. Verse number 17, For he received from God... The Father, honor and glory, when there, were, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. And so there's, there's two times in the life of Christ where the Father said of the Son, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The first time was when Jesus Christ was baptized by John the Baptist, you know, and the Holy Ghost came down upon him. Uh, also, though, when he was upon the holy mount. You say, what is that about? Well, let's go there. Let's go to Matthew 17. Let's go to Matthew 17 and verse number 1. Let's go to the story there. So Peter's just, you know, telling us, listen, we don't follow fables. I'm an eyewitness. I'm telling you the truth. You know, I even saw the power of God. I even heard the voice of the Father, he says. When he said about his son, this is my beloved son. I, I heard that. Okay? He, he's, a, he's a trusted eyewitness. He, you know, he's someone we can trust. When he, you know, and it's not, look, and we'll go through it later. These are not just the words of Peter, actually. We'll, go, we'll look at that soon, okay? But let's go to Matthew 17, verse number 1. Let's look at the story there. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter. So there's Peter, James, and John, his brother. So there's three of them. And bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. So that's the holy mount that Peter referred to in Second Peter. And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. So Jesus transforms, transfigures. He doesn't look like a normal human being anymore. He puts on the glory. All right? it, it, you know, this is Jesus in heaven. This is his, his, the fullness of his glory you know, is on show here. All right? So he's transfigured. Verse number three, and behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Of course, Moses and Elias are in heaven, okay? So somehow, some, some, you know, normally there's a division between heaven and earth, but on this mount, 
that, that separation was gone, okay? They're, they're kind of walking they're on the earth, but they're kind of in heaven at the same time, okay? That's what's going on. Verse number four. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Now, when Peter is saying these words, he's, we'll look soon, but he's not making any sense. Like, it's not right to build tabernacles for men, okay? The tab- what was the tabernacle? Remember, that's the place that you would go and, and, see, and have, you know, uh, experience the presence of God. You would go there and offer sacrifices. That's, that's something for God. That's not for men, okay? So when Peter's saying these things, he's not talking out of clarity of mind. He's overwhelmed, in other words. He's overwhelmed with what he's seen, okay? He's experiencing a slice of heaven, you know, he's experiencing the glory of Jesus Christ. You'll soon see that he's not, he's not making any sense. Verse number five. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And so if this voice is saying, This is my beloved Son, who's speaking? God the Father, of course. And he's being covered by this cloud. No man has seen God the Father. I think if they saw the God the Father, they'd be destroyed at that point, okay? And the Bible's very clear. No one has seen him except Jesus Christ. And we will see God the Father one day. That's in the new heavens and the new earth. But look at verse number six. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. So you can see that they're not, that they're not taking it very well, okay? They're not taking it very well. Verse number seven. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Now, I'll just share something with you very quickly. You know, I, I'm not, you know, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not, I'm not talking about some charismatic vision or Pentecostal stuff, right? But there was a time where I was sort of debating amongst myself. I was starting to learn about the, the King James Bible. I, I knew the King James Bible was a word of God, right? But I, I had read my NIV, my new King James for so long, for so many years, and I was struggling to understand God's Word. Well, I'll never forget the time where I just said, you know what, Lord, I just threw my old Bibles in the bin, and I said, look, I, I, I can't really understand this English. You need to help me, Lord, now. Like, you need to just help me. And I'm just opening the Bible, and all of a sudden, look, I'm just telling you, this is the truth, okay? I'm just, I'm just, I'm not making things up, right? I could, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm reading the King James Bible, and it's like making perfect sense. I, and, and I'm just reading it, it's like, what in the world? It's like while I was holding on to those old Bibles, I just couldn't really get it. You know, I kind of wanted that dumbed down English. But now that I got rid of them, somehow God has opened my eyes a little more and I can read this much more. And as I'm reading God's Word, it just dawned on me, I'm reading God's Word. Like, it's, it's not just a book. All right? I, I'm, I'm re- these are words that God breathed into existence. He moved men to write these words. And I, it just, I started to think about Moses and how when Moses went up to the mount and God gave him the Ten Commandments and God, you know, wrote on those Ten Commandments with his own finger, the Bible tells us. And I'm just thinking, I've got, this, I've got, this, I've got the same thing. I've, I've got more than Ten Commandments. I've got the Ten Commandments there in Exodus. I've got much more than that. And I'm telling you, I could not lift my face from the ground. I was like reading my Bible. I was like this. And I was so scared that if I lifted my face up that I'd see God. Like, I, you know, it's just, it, it was overwhelming to me that I had such a precious gift in my hands. And I was afraid to lift up my head. Now, I'm not saying God was literally there. I kind of felt like, though, if I lifted my eyes, I'm going to see God and I don't want to see Him. Because <laughs> I'm going to get wiped out. <laughs> it's kind of, like, that's kind of the idea. And it, like, that's the closest that I can come to understanding how Peter felt and the other disciples here. And they're hearing the voice of God. Okay? Look, we got the Word of God. You know, they're hearing it. It's like, wow. And they're so afraid. They can't even lift up their eyes, right? Jesus comes, arise, be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Things went back to normal, okay, when they lifted up their eyes. And so this is an amazing thing that they experienced. You know, don't downplay this amazing uh, vision of heaven, the voice of God, seeing Old Testament prophets. It's like, where's the line between heaven and earth? It just got clouded. It just, you know, there was no real division there. And the glory of Jesus Christ. And so what he experienced was amazing. Back to 2 Peter now. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 19. So Peter's telling us, he's experienced this. Oh boy, that would have been an experience, right? Verse number 19. Then he says this. 
we have also... So he's saying, look, I'm an eyewitness. I've seen this about Jesus. I've seen this miracle. But then he says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. He says, look, we've got something even better than that. We've got something even more sure, more, more than my eyewitness, more than my account of what I experienced. We have something more than that. So even though we would think how amazing it would be to be like Peter and experience this, we've got something even more amazing. We have something even more sure, the more sure word of prophecy, the Bible that we hold in our hands, this precious book. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. Hey, you do well if you take heed, if you listen, if you pay attention to the, God's word as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Hey, what is that about? Where's, where's he gone? Well, keep your finger there and go to Malachi chapter 4. I did go through the book of Malachi. I think, did I go through it while we weren't having church? I think that roughly around that time, right, with the pandemic. But let's go to Malachi chapter 4 verse number 1. Peter's saying, look, you've got a more sure word of prophecy, even better than experiencing an eyewitness account of Jesus' uh, transfiguration. You've got the Bible. So take heed, listen, pay attention to the words of God, right? Until when? How long should we be doing that, brethren? It says, uh, until the day dawn. So keep listening, keep learning the Bible until the day dawn. What's that? Until the morning? Just one day? Now, what is the day dawning here about? It says, and the day star arise in your hearts. Now, the day star, brethren, of course, is a name. The day star is the sun. Okay, it's the sun. It's a day star. <laughs> it's the star that you see in the day. It's the sun. Okay? But that day star needs to arise in your hearts. And, of course, that is symbolic. The sun is being symbolic there of Jesus Christ. Okay, so, but when does this day star arise in your hearts? What is the timing of this? He's saying, look, keep learning the Bible until this happens. Say, so, well, what, when does this happen? Well, Malachi chapter 4 gives us that information. Well, even Peter does as we keep going through the chapters of this Bible, okay, of, of this book. But let's have a look at Malachi chapter 4, verse number 1, which says, For behold, the day cometh, there comes a day, right, that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. What does that sound like to you? It doesn't sound like God pouring out his wrath on the world. Okay, so that's end time stuff. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. This is definitely about the end times, and I'll show you why soon. Look at verse number two. But unto you, so that's unto the saved, that fear my name, shall the Son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stool. All right, so this is about end times. He says, look, after the Lord burns this world like an oven, after the Lord pours out His wrath, you know, during that, that time of the day of the Lord, that day is coming, all right? Then uh, we, we'll have the Son of Righteousness arise in our hearts, right? Or well, it says there, arise, arise. And in Second Peter it said, arise in our hearts, right? Arise with healing our wings, and ye shall go forth. So once this happens, we will go forth and do something. What are we going to do? Verse number three. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I do this, saith the Lord of hosts. So we will tread down the wicked. We will have authority. Okay, what is that about? So we know that the Lord will destroy it all during the, His wrath on the day of the Lord. Then Christ comes back. All right, the Lord comes back. Then we're going to be given, we're going to be issued the command to go forth and have authority on the earth. We're going to rule and reign with Christ. That is when that uh, son of righteousness arises. And that's when 2 Peter chapter 1 talks about that they start arising in your hearts. So what is he saying? This is what Peter is saying. You can go back to 2 Peter now. He's saying, look, keep reading the Bible. Keep listening to preaching. Keep learning God's word until then. Okay, just keep doing it, brethren. There's no need for us to stop. Of course, by then, we're going to have our new resurrected bodies. Of course, by then, we're going to be with Jesus Christ. You know, and then He's going to make the new heaven and the new earth, and we'll be able to see the face of the Father. But until then, brethren, we keep learning God's Word. We keep learning His Bible. We keep reading the Word of God. Okay, we keep establishing ourselves upon the more sure Word of prophecy. 
In other words, don't stop. Keep learning. Every day of your life, read a portion of Scripture. Don't stop. Keep listening. Keep learning. Okay? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, what is that saying? There's two ways you can understand this. I'll, I'll tell you the primary way to understand this. So it's saying that basically nothing in the scriptures, so nothing in, the, in this book that you hold in your hands is from the private thoughts of man. Okay? So what is it saying? That, you know, this is from God, is what it's saying. Okay? Even though Peter has penned this, even though he says, look, I'm just going to, my desire is to keep reminding you, even after I've deceased. Okay? And you, you can have the idea, well, this is Peter. And yes, it is coming from Peter. But it's not his own private interpretation. This is not his own private thoughts. This is God that told Peter to write these things. This is God that caused Peter to say these words. Okay? It's not the private interpretation of a man. That's the primary understanding of that verse. The secondary understanding of that verse is that no doctrinal teaching okay, can be traced back to one man's private ideas or thoughts. Okay, so if I come behind the pulpit and I preach something, you're like, I've never heard that before. That is weird. All right? And, and, and then you, like, you kind of find out that I'm the only one that ever teaches that stuff. That's, that's wrong. That's my private interpretation. That, that's not how God works. You know, all of us, we all have the like precious faith. We all have the Holy Spirit. Okay? Every generation... Look, anything I preach should have been preached by any previous generation of, of preachers before me. There should be nothing original or private coming from my mouth, okay? And this is why I ended up rejecting the pre-tribulation rapture, okay? Because when I wanted more information about the pre-tribulation rapture, I'd say, pastor or, you know, brother so-and-so, I can't see what you're preaching. Can you show me? Oh, you got to go to Bible college. Oh, you got to read this book. Okay. Trying to be obedient, trying to learn, trying to increase knowledge. Read the book. Okay, who wrote this? Bible college. Where does this come from? And I found that if you just pull the string, you pull the chain, you start pulling the chain, you get through Dallas Theological Seminary. Okay, well, that was founded by Schaefer. I forget his first name. Something Schaefer. Okay, you keep pulling. That guy was mentored by some guy, that I forget his name right now, which was mentored by Schofield. You keep pulling. And uh, Schofield's mentor was mentored by John Nelson Darby from the, Plym uh, from the uh, what do they call him? The Plymouth Brethren. Okay, Darby. Oh, he, what, he created dispensationalism? His, what? Before, okay, keep pulling. No, no, it's, it stopped. It stopped with one man. One man's private interpretation. Hey, where does it keep going from there? No one. No one taught the pre-tribulation rapture before John Nelson Darby. And his contemporaries, you know, thought he was losing his mind. Right? Other people that lived in his area said, Darby, you're crazy. You're teaching weird things. You're preaching things of a private interpretation. That's why I had to reject the pre-tribulation rapture. I came to realize it's the interpretation of one man. You can trace. If you can trace a doctrine to one man, and you can never see that being taught anywhere else in history, you know that's a private interpretation. Okay? And so that is the secondary understanding of that, right? Th there should be nothing that I preach that's original from my, from my mouth. You know, yes, the way I put it together, the way I present it might be original, but the contents must be the same content that's been preached throughout the centuries by any preacher. Okay? Verse number 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man... But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Brethren, this book is not written by the will of man. In fact, it makes men look really bad. It makes you and I, we can read this, it makes us look bad. Okay, sometimes it's hard for me to get up and preach because I know well, I, I fail there too. <laughs> right? But I've got to preach the whole counsel of God, I'm not perfect. You know? and, and so, this is not a book written by the will of man. If you get a man to write about religion... He's going to write about how wonderful we are, how special we are. He's going to write about how we're all gods. We're all one of the same universal mind, you know, and, and every religion, every faith will lead you to God. Hey, that's what, the, that's what, you know, if that's what a man would write, you know, if he was writing some holy book. Look, this book does not glorify man. This book only glorifies God. 
only glorifies God, right? And we can only have that divine nature. We only, because of what God's done for us, right? The fact that He's given us His holy word. And so, it says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Just remind yourself, brethren, this is not a book of man. It's a book of God. The Holy Ghost wrote this book. The Lord God wrote this book. What are you going to do? This one, sh- you know, this one sits on your shelf. You know, you've got all these other novels. You've got all these commentaries of men, maybe on your sh- I don't know, you know, on your shelf. Maybe you've got some DVDs of men. And you've got that one sitting there. And you know, all of this has been produced by man. And this one's been produced by God. So when you desire to read something, what should be the first thing that you pull out of the shelf? What should be the first thing that you pull out in the morning? I want to see what God has to say to me, right? I want to see what the Holy Ghost has to say to me. Hey, I want to see what Peter is still reminding me of today, right? Even back before when he was living, he still wants me to be aware of these things. Or whoever, you know, that the Holy Ghost used uh, to move and write the Word of God. And so the more sure Word of Prophecy in our hands, take heed keep reading, keep listening to the Word of God to the day you die, till the day star arise in your hearts, till we can be with Jesus Christ for all eternity. Okay, let's pray.